Our study this week out of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, calling on the name of the Lord, yud Hey vav Hey, in the story of Seth. So Genesis 4 verse 25, Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. I think it's interesting the Bible uses this term, Adam knew his wife again. They knew his wife and they had a kid. So just knowing, this, that's what the word is. That just means he knew her. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, I guess very sanctified or very uh, PG or even G, right, uh, version of, he just knew his wife and that was enough for them to have another child. Uh, but that's the term that's used. That's what uh, the definition of it is. He knew his wife and she bore him another son, Seth. And they called him appointed because God had chosen him, appointed him, instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And again, the, the tragedy and the pain that they must have experienced in that loss of losing Cain, and then being reminded of it here with uh, having another child and naming it, still thinking, obviously, is obviously months later, at least nine months later or more, after uh, Abel has been killed, and they're still thinking, they named him, Seth, because we no longer have Cain. I mean, we no longer have Abel, nor do we have Cain. And, and so the loss of both those sons was still heavy on their hearts. Verse 26, as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. And we're going to get into that whole phrase and that whole what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? But first I want to look a little bit more about Seth as we study Seth in light of this. This is the first time that phrase is used in the Bible. But let's look a little bit more about Seth. Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own image after his image, in his own likeness after his image, and named him Seth. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And so Adam lived 130 years before he has Seth, and so he had, no doubt, many children before that time, because uh, when Cain goes off, Cain goes, marries someone, and goes off, builds a city, and has other people there, and, and so in that time. And then the next uh, 800 years of Adam's life, he and Eve had a lot of children, no doubt, hundreds of children, and I feel really bad for Eve, uh, for, you know, that. I can't imagine what she looked like by the end of that time. But, uh, <laughs> but she, uh, she was uh, no doubt very active. And uh, it says that Adam begot a son in his own image, in his likeness. And we've talked about this before, but it's important to review it. It's not in God's image. God, Adam and Eve were created in God's image, Seth was created in Adam's image, in Adam's image after the fall. And again, if you missed some of those topics, go back on shalomadventure.com and you can see the, the discussions on, uh, on whose image are we in and what likeness and why do we do what we do. And then it went on verse 5 and said he lived 930 years total and then he died. went to heaven. No, it doesn't say, it says he died, right? And the soul that sinneth, he shall die, right? And Adam died, right? And as God told uh, Adam and Eve, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. die. And certain, Satan disagreed with that. Satan told them, you will not surely die, right? So it all depends who we want to believe, whether we want to believe God or whether we want to believe Satan on what happened to Adam and all the rest. Since then, the Bible says he died. And that means... He died, right? He was dead, right? And, uh, and so that's what the Bible says. And then regarding Seth, verse chapter 5, Genesis 5, verse 6, Seth lived 105 years and begot Enos. And after he begot Enos, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died, right? So he also died. Uh, waiting the resurrection. But he lived also 900 years. They lived a lot of years, these guys, and had lots of sons, lots of daughters populating the earth 
very rapidly. And, you know, we have this picture that, uh, that the world wants to paint in our minds that they were all just cave people and just drawing stick figures on cave walls. No, they lived, they were close with God, Adam right out of God's hand, and lived all this time. And not only did Seth live over 900 years and have all the knowledge built up that he could learn from mistakes and learn from successes in 900 years, but he's still learning from Adam. Adam's still alive uh, most of that time, and he's learning from, from Adam and all these other people who are living this long. And so they had a wealth of knowledge available to them. And again, Adam right out of the Creator's hand. And having communed, we don't know for how long, with the Creator, no doubt much, much more intelligent than we are in just the short period of time that we live and can grasp things, and even with our uh, degraded mental capacity, even though we have books and, and, and years and years of built-up knowledge, not like they had, not like the abilities they had. And so they were, I believe, quite intelligent and quite able to do things beyond what we can imagine today. Um, but they lived again a long time, and then, so Seth lives 900 years, and he died. And then we have First Chronicles that mentions Seth, chapter 1, verse 1, Adam, Seth, even though Adam had a lot of children, Seth is the one that's mentioned. And then his son that was just mentioned, of all the children that Seth had, Enos is the only one that's mentioned. So Enos, and then down the line, including um, Enoch. And we know, and we'll learn about Enoch in another few weeks. He doesn't die. <laughs> and in contrast to all the rest that died, he doesn't die, he goes straight to heaven. And again, we'll get into him uh, maybe next week. And then all the way through Noah and through all the way to Abraham. So Abraham's line came through Seth. Of all the children that God gave to Adam and Eve, Seth is the one. And then we go all the way to the Messiah and work our ways backwards. In Luke chapter 3, starting with Yeshua, began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, all the way back to Judah and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham and all the way back to Methuselah, Enos, Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And so again, Seth is the line that God used to bring about Abraham, David, and the Messiah. So the special child, the seed that the promise would come through. And so back to Genesis 4, 26, Seth named him, had a son, named him Enos, and then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Or then men yeah, began to call on the name of the Lord. So what does it mean, this calling on the name of the Lord? Now it might be in relation that he just had this son Seth, uh, Enos, and in that experience of becoming a father might have greatly impacted him. But what does it mean, this call in the name of the Lord? Let's look at this phrase other places in the Bible. In Genesis 12, regarding Abraham, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then chapter 13, verse 4, Abram called on the name of the Lord. And then Genesis 21, verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarack tree in Beersheba and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Now each one of these times, it's Lord is spelled Yud, He, Vav, He in Hebrew. And so all those times, three different times, Abraham called on the name of the Lord and then we jump to Isaac in Genesis 26. Isaac went to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. And so he built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. Again, yod heh vav -Hey, Even though here God refers to himself just as the God of Abraham, your father. Doesn't refer to himself as yod heh vav -Hey, just Elohim of your father Abraham. But Isaac calls on the name of the Lord. So is there something special about this name 
the spelling of this name, that if we get this spelling just right, we're calling on the name of the Lord exactly like Isaac did, exactly like Abraham did, exactly like Seth did. Well, let's continue. Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And so he says to the prophets of Baal, you call on your gods, and it's, a, it's a Elohim or a variation of Elohim, and I will count on the Lord, and here again, yud hey vav hey, the God who answered by fire. He is the true Elohim. He is God. He is Elohim. Yes. Zephaniah 3, verse 8, all the earth shall be devoured with fire of my jealousy, for then I will restore to the people pure lips that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. So after God destroys all the wicked of this earth with the fire, destroying the earth, laying them out from one end of the earth to the other, not lamented, not buried, burning them up with his, the brightness of his coming, and then those that remain and are alive restores to them pure lips so that they call on the name of the Lord and also serve him in one accord, unity together. And then in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 32, it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this yud hey vav and that verse is quoted in Twice, in the, once in the book of Acts, chapter 2, and Romans, chapter 10. And we'll look at that in a minute. This is very interesting. So if we just get the name right, if we can just pronounce it right, that yud hey vav if we call on the name of the Lord, boom, we're saved. This is magical word. You just say this word and it's all done. Is that what he's saying there? Is that what it means? Well, let's look to how it's written in the book of Acts and in the book of Romans. Same verse, quoting this verse. Peter, Acts 2, 21. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, kurios, shall be saved. That's the Greek. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, by Paul, Paul says, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, kurios, shall be saved. Now, neither one of these writers... Now, even if Peter was speaking in Hebrew and spoke to the people in Hebrew, he wouldn't be necessarily speaking in Greek. Uh, this is where actually everyone's hearing in their own language. So they're all hearing it in whatever language, wherever they were from, from those from Greece, maybe in Greek, and from Cyprus and Egypt and all the various different places that had come together on Shavuos to hear. But Luke, I think, is the one who wrote Acts, and he writes doesn't write yud hey vav hey. He writes Lord, kurios, which just means Lord, just means master. It's used other places in the Bible when Yeshua says uh, uh, you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve uh, mammon and, and, and the Lord. Or other places where he talks about, a, uh, tells a parable and, and the master of the household and he uses this word kurios, talking about a human being who's just in charge of the farm or, or, or the household. He uses the same word. And that's the word that's written here in Greek. Not yud hey vav hey. And the same with Paul. In Romans, he's probably writing in, in Greek or Latin, but he doesn't use yud hey vav hey. It's kurios. Now, why is that? Why? If, if yud hey vav hey is so important, you've got to just pronounce it exactly right. And that's the only way you can be saved. You've got to have the name. You've got to have the name right. If you don't have the name right, God won't hear you. He won't know who you're talking about. He won't know who you're talking to. Then why didn't Peter, or at least whoever translated Peter, or Peter might have just used Adonai, or again, whatever would be the equivalent for the people that were hearing as he was speaking in, in the language gift that God had blessed him with and the others so that everyone could hear in their own language. And Paul, speaking here, he used that word Lord. Kurios and not yud hey vav hey. 
Let's look at another text in the book of Matthew. This is Yeshua speaking. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Kurios. Now here again, Yeshua probably wasn't speaking Greek here. He's probably speaking Hebrew. But Matthew translating it or Matthew writing it down didn't write yod heh vav heh. Now he could have. Even if he's writing in Greek, still when he writes the name, he still could write the name. But he didn't. And so maybe Yeshua used the word, uh, if he was speaking Hebrew, maybe he used the word which would be equivalent to kurios, would be Adonai. But Matthew wrote it down as kurios, not yod heh vav heh. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, there's places in the Bible where Hebrew is brought into the Greek. For example, here in, um, this is in Revelation, I think it's Revelation 9. And the name of him in Hebrew is Abadion. And that is how it's written there in the Greek book, the book of Revelation written in Greek. They kept the Hebrew, they changed used the Greek letters, but they used the same pronunciation that it is in Hebrew. And then it continues on, and in the Greek, the name is Apollyon. And then it has the Greek and the pronunciation for Apollyon. So it's just two names, same name, but one as it's pronounced in Hebrew, and one how it's pronounced in Greek. And there are places, several places unlike that. In the Hebrew, Armageddon, uh, in the Hebrew, Golgotha, in the Hebrew, um, uh, Bethsaida. And so there's various places where it says, and in the Hebrew, obviously they were writing in Greek. If they were writing in Hebrew, they wouldn't have to say in the Hebrew, right? So obviously they were writing in Greek, and then when they wanted to say a Hebrew word, and they made that statement, but in the Hebrew it's pronounced, and they wrote how it's pronounced in Hebrew. So if we had the pronunciation for how to pronounce the yod heh vav heh, it would tell us. But nowhere in the second part of the Bible is it written. Not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke, not John, not as they quote Yeshua, not Peter, not Paul, not James, not, none of them. None of them. Out of all those books, out of all those quotes, out of all those statements, even when they're quoting directly from the first part in the Bible where it uses the yod heh vav heh, none of them told us exactly how it's pronounced. So there are groups that say, oh, this is how you pronounce it. And other groups that say, this is how you pronounce it. And other groups that say, this is how you pronounce it. But for whatever reason, the gospel writers and Yeshua himself did not tell us how exactly to pronounce it. And in the Ten Commandments, it says, Exodus 20, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord, yod heh vav heh, your God in vain. For the Lord, yod heh vav heh, will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So if it's having to, you have to pronounce it exactly right, and you got these various different groups that say, this is how you pronounce it, they don't, dis, they don't agree, and only one of them, Max, could be right, that would mean everybody else is wrong. And thus God will not hold them guiltless because they didn't pronounce it exactly right. Now what we have is the consonants. We don't have the vowels today. And so it's impossible to know exactly how it was pronounced. Right? If I just threw a couple vowels out to you, it could be lots of different words without any, a, a, a few consonants without any vowels. Right? For example, if I just gave you a, a letter, an R and a D, what word could that be? It could be rod, it could be red, it could be read, it could be read the color, it could be read the book, right? It could be road, it could be the, the read in the, the grass, it could be read the book, it could be read in the grass, it could be lots of different words when all you have is the two letters. Let's say I could throw four letters out and I'm, I'm sure we could come up with lots of different, depending on what vowels you throw in there. And we don't have the vowels. So we don't know. And Yeshua didn't tell us. And Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, none of them told us either. 
Thankfully, we have these organizations who are willing to tell us <laughs> exactly how it's supposed to be. And so if it's not about pronunciation, then what is it all about? Because obviously, they called on the name of the Lord, and we're not to take his name in vain. So what exactly does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Well, in Exodus 34, verse 5, the Lord descended in a cloud and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the father upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. That's Exodus 34, verse 5, through 8, or through 7. And the very next verse, Moses replies, and here he's saying, His name, I proclaim my name, the Lord, yod heh vav -Hey. The Lord, yod heh vav -Hey. passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, yod heh vav -Hey. The Lord, yod heh vav -Hey. El, not even Elohim, just El. And the very next verse, verse 8, Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, if I have now found grace in your sight, O Lord, not yod heh vav -Hey, Adonai. Let my Lord, Adonai, I pray, go among us, even though we are stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. And God reached down and smacked Moses in the face. What are you, dumb? I just told you, it's your day of hey, Why are you calling me out an eye? It wasn't about pronunciation. So what is it about? Let's look in the Psalm, Psalm 148. Let them praise the name of the Lord, yod heh vav -Hey, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and the heavens. And here we have this Hebrew poetry, very common in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, where they say a phrase, and then they say exactly the same thing, but using different words. But same meaning all interchangeable. So his name is exalted. His glory is above the earth and the heavens. So interchangeable, exalted, and above the earth and heavens, and interchangeable, his name and his glory. All right, so you can read it. His glory alone is exalted. His name is above the earth and the heavens. All right, so you see how they're interchangeable. So when it's referring to his name, it's not talking about letters. He's talking about his glory, yeah. about his character, about who he is. Abram had his name changed from Abram to Abraham because his history changed, his future changed. Sarai had her name changed to Sarah. Jacob had his name changed to Israel because his character changed from being a deceiver and a, and a heel grabber and a, one who trips people up to being an overcomer with God, victorious with God, wrestling with God and with man and prevailing. A prevailer with God. A prince with God. God changed his character, thus he changed his name. God changed his destiny, God changed his future, thus his name changed. And so God's name represents his destiny, his character, who he is, not how his name is pronounced. That's not what's important. That's become an idol, this pronouncing of a name. And we ignore the one who it's really is about, his glory. And we see this, let's look back at that exodus Experience where God was speaking with Moses and go just a few verses before it. Moses said, this is Exodus 33, 18. Moses said, please show me your glory. And in response to that request, show me your glory. 
the Lord proclaimed the name of the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God. That's his glory. So again, we see it interchangeably here. He says, show me your glory. And he says, here's my name. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. This is what it means to call on the name of the Lord. God has a lot of attributes. God has a lot of hats. He has a lot of names. He's our provider, he's our savior, he's our creator, he's our redeemer, he's our king, he's our lord, he's our all in all. He's our brother, he's our friend, he's our spouse, he's everything to us. Lots of names because he has lots of roles. And so when you're calling on the name of the Lord, it means calling on him in truth and in spirit and in heart and in reality and calling on a being, a person you believe in that you know personally attached to and for the role you're needing at the time. If you're needing mercy, call on the merciful one because his name is mercy. If you're needing grace, call upon him who is gracious. If you're needing patience, call on him who is long-suffering. He will meet your need. One who is good and abounding in goodness when you're dealing and rubbing shoulders with the evil of this world and the troubles of this world and the problems of this world and the liars and the despisers and the, 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 the abusers. And we need someone who's good. You need a friend who's good. You need a God who's good. Cry out to him who is good and goodness. When you need truth, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. We need to discern between right and wrong and truth and error. Call on him who is truth, the truth, and all truth, and nothing but the truth. Reach out to him and call on him who is truth. When you need forgiveness, call on him who is mercy, merciful and forgiving iniquity and transgression. When we've blown it, when God reveals to us our hard-heartedness and our sin, cry out to him and call out to him, Lord, have mercy, forgive me for my transgression. Thank you for giving your son as a sacrifice in my behalf. Thank you for cleansing me of all unrighteousness. Thank you for taking my sins upon me, upon yourself and dying for my sins. Thank you for being the one who is so patient, so long-suffering, so merciful. Thank you for forgiving me for all my iniquity, for all my sins, for all my transgression. The one who will no wise clear the guilty. The one who is judge and who will enact judgment when we're wronged, when we're hurt, when we're abused. Lord, I need you who will deal judgment, who will not clear the guilty, who judges equal with equality, who judges fairly, who deals with justice, who will bring about penalty for the wrongs that are done in this earth, who won't let the canes of this world get away with it forever. Call upon him and your time of need. So what you're needing at the time, that's what you're calling upon. When you're needing a God to step in and strong and powerful and judge, you're not calling out, Lord, lay me down to sleep, give me a good night's rest, right? <laughs> Thank you for this food, right? So you're calling in the need at the time. Not a rote prayer, not something that was written thousands of years ago or even days ago, but personally calling out from your heart, yes. calling on him who can help you in your time of need, come boldly before the throne of grace so that he can help you with your current need. Continues with the same theme in Deuteronomy 32. 
For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribing greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth, without injustice, righteous and upright is he. So again, calling on the name of the Lord. His name is, he's the rock. When you need stability, when you're being attacked and waves hitting you and blow, the wind blowing you and trying to knock you off course and trying to knock you down, you need that solid rock to build a foundation on. Secure, immovable, unchanging. Lord, call upon that rock. Lord, help me. Help me to stand against these trials, against these temptations, against these difficulties. Give me the ability. Surround me with your strong tower. Be the rock of my salvation. Be my defense. Call on the rock. He who is perfect, who makes no mistake, when we don't understand why, why, God, I don't understand. I prayed for this and it didn't happen. I thought this is the what should be best and I don't understand, but you know what's best. You're perfect. You don't change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're consistent. You're perfect in all your ways. And in the end, everything will work out as you had desired. To those who love you, those called according to your purpose. You are perfect. You are right. You know what you're doing. You answer my prayers according to what is best in my behalf. You love me with an everlasting love. You are perfect. And your ways are perfect. And his ways are justice. Brings about justice, true justice. Not like we see on this earth. Not where the rich get off. Not with who you know. But equal justice, equal balances. Who discerns between the, discerns between the righteous and the wicked. Those who repent of their sins and those who are faking it. Those who are right and those who are wrong. Those who are truly victims and those who are truly abusers. He is justice. And he will bring about justice in the earth. He will destroy this earth with fire. He will destroy the wicked once and for all. Satan and every evil angel and everyone who's followed him. He will enact justice in the earth. And he'll create a new heavens and a new earth. Wherein dwells righteousness. And all things will be made new. Again, second time, he is truth. A God of truth. There is truth. In a world that says there is no truth. That there's lots of ways and lots of paths. And your opinion and not my opinion, everyone's opinion, it all doesn't matter. It's all equal anyway. There's lots of ways. No, there is truth. And there is error. There is right and there is wrong. There is God's way. There's God's path. And he is without injustice. He doesn't show favoritism. He doesn't show prejudice. He doesn't have any injustice. He doesn't have any favoritism. He loves all equally. He paid the same price for all. For the sins of the world, Yeshua gave his life. Not wanting that any should perish. Not wanting that any should be lost. Giving equal opportunity to all. He's righteous. He's right and he's always right. And he's righteous in all his ways. He does what is right among us. He does what is best for us. Not necessarily what we always want, what we always think is best for us, but what is always right for us. He is righteous. There's no sin, sin in him. There's no yin and yang. He's not half good and half bad. He is only good. He is all righteous. And only righteous. And to call on the one who is righteous. And he is upright. He is steadfast. He is secure. He is straight in a narrow path. And in all these attributes, he wants to put his name upon you. He wants to put his character upon you. He wants his name exalted in our lives. This is what it means. Don't use his name in vain. Take his name upon yourself. 
I am his child. He's adopted me. I'm now under his name. And then, by his grace, live up to that name. By his power, live uprightly. Live justly. Live truthfully. Without partiality, without prejudice, without moving, without being like waves tossed to and fro, but consistent. Not fearful, not worrying, not fretful, but upright, secure in the Lord. Because we're standing on his character. We're standing on his glory. We're standing on his name. On his guarantee. On his promises. Right, we use that phrase, oh, this company's got a good name. What does that mean? It sounds good? That it's pretty? That it makes a nice song? That it's musical to the ear? What does it mean that, name, that company has a good name? Right, there used to be a commercial with a name like Smuckers, it's got to be good, right? With Smuckers, it's so good, you know? With a name like, what does that mean? You know, so if it's a horrible name, it's a hard pronounced name, that means it's good? You know, so it, it uh, used to be a skit. Oh, so with a name like dog poop, it's got to be fabulous. Oh, it must be, you've got a name like that, it's got to be wonderful, right? Anyone with a name, it's so ridiculous a name, it's got to be the best thing in the world. I'm just saying they stand behind their name, they put their name on the label, it's going to taste good, and if it doesn't taste good, it's a reflection on them. Yes, yes. The reputation, they've got a good reputation. Right. And God has a good reputation. His name, call upon his name because he's got a good reputation. Yeah. You're calling upon him, a living being, not just four letters. And the one who is, the self-existent one, the one who is and who has been and always will be, the one who is before and is and, and, and will be forever. Amen. That is who we call upon. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. And Seth called on him. And maybe because he saw in his son, in having a child, what that meant. When he saw this little babe dependent on him, needing to have his diaper changed, needing to have food put into his mouth, needing to be picked up, couldn't even walk. And Seth realized how dependent he is on God. I can do nothing without you. I need you, calling on him. Lord, help me like a baby crying, not even knowing what to say, just crying out. Change me, <laughs> pick me up, hold me, feed me. Crying out to the Lord. We don't even know what we need. So we cry out to him. And then there's a little child training him to walk. Training him not to get hit by the donkey. Watch out where you're walking. Don't walk out in the road, be careful walking, the camels, it's dangerous, teaching them as God leads us and directs us and shows us. We hold our hand, hold his hand crossing the road. Seth learned about what it meant to call on the name of the Lord in having his son. And so he called out to him as his son called out to him. And then the son wanting to copy the father and as we call on the name of the Lord because we're wanting to copy his image. We're wanting to be recreated back into his image. We want to be born again. We want to be born all new. Not in Adam's image, but in God's image. Death to self, alive and new in the Holy Spirit. And taking on the attributes of the Heavenly Father. So that when the people see us, they don't see us, but they see God's glory. As God's glory shined off of Moses when he came off the mountain, God wants to shine his glory off of us. It's in his character. It's in his name. That's what it means. To call on the name of the Lord. Calling on a living being. The Bible says that Cain brought his offering to yud heh vav -Heh. So it wasn't about the name. It wasn't about bringing it to the right place. His heart wasn't in the right place. Even if he was pronouncing the name right. Scriptures tell of a story of, of these sons of Sceva. I think there were five brothers. They went to go and, and deliver some guy who was possessed by a demon. And, and they go in there and they proclaim the right name in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the one who Paul preaches. And that demon jumped on them and beat all five of them up. 
beat them so bad they ran out of there naked. It's not just pronouncing the name. It's not a magic wand. It's not a hocus pocus. You say the right words in the right order and the right pronunciation, then God saves us and answers all our prayers. It's having a humble heart, like a child. Lord, help me, change me, feed me, pick me up, hold me. Teach me to walk in the right way. Point me in the right direction. Teach me how to live. Show me how to live. Put your name upon me. Let me be called by your name. Let me live up to your reputation. And I follow in your footsteps. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. And so whatever you're going through tonight, what are you needing from God? Which role, which hat do you need him to be wearing in your life? Are you needing guidance? Are you in a fork in the road? Should I turn this way or that way? Need to make a decision in your life? Maybe regarding a purchase or a relationship? What are you needing? Call out to him for guidance. If you're needing understanding of his word, you're needing truth, you're wanting to understand and discern his word more, hearing lots of views and lots of different ideas, you want to know what is truth? Call on the one who is truth and he will reveal himself to you. He will reveal the truth to you. You're needing mercy. Have you blown it? You have sin on your record. You need one who's merciful, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And call upon him. In the moment we pray, call upon that God. Call upon that role. You need him to recreate in you a new heart. You need the creator God to give you victory over sin, to empower you and give you a new mind and a new heart and a new life and change you from the areas in your life, the struggles and the the habits that you've developed over time or the sinful tendencies, cultivated tendencies or inherited tendencies to evil, you need to be set free. You need God to create in you a new heart, a new life. Lord, birth all things in me, make all things new. Your concern for that friend, that neighbor, that child, that family member who doesn't know the Lord. Lord, be a savior. Be a light. Let your glory shine through me. Let your glory shine upon that person. Call upon him who is merciful, who's gracious, who doesn't want any to be lost. Call upon the one who gave his life for your friend, for your family member. Cry out to him. Call upon him. In that name, in that role, Lord, save them. Lord, help them. Lord, open their eyes. You need healing for yourself or for a friend. Bring them, even if you have to cut through the roof, bring your friend to the Lord, even if you need healing. Come to him. Lord, heal me. Lord, open my eyes. Heal my legs. Heal my sin-sick soul. Heal me inside and out, physically and spiritually and emotionally, of the emotional scars that I have. Heal me. Call upon him who is the healer, the great physician, the counselor, the comforter. Lots of names. Pick which one is for the need that you have today. Cry out to him in your need. Maybe out of adoration and love. Thank you, Lord, you're loving. Thank you, God, you're good. Thank you, God, that you're consistent. Call out to him in praise and in thanksgiving and give him glory and honor for all that he has already done, for all that he has promised to do. Thank you, Lord, for providing for all my needs according to your riches and glory. And so whatever applies to you, or maybe you have needs, Lord, provide for my need financial need, whatever it is. So let's pray together. Let's take a moment and I'll say some words and then we'll be quiet. And each individually just crying out to the Lord. 
in your own heart, in your own mind, calling out to him. The real, the living God. Then I'll close it off with an amen. Our Lord and our God, thank you that you see all, you hear all, you're here for us. Thank you, your presence is here. Thank you, you've uplifted us and before your throne. Surround us with your rainbow of promise. Surround us in your arms. Draw us close to your side. Lift us up above the cares of this earth. Give us the ability to see your face. To come boldly before your throne. Take the scales off of our eyes. Lord, we want to know you intimately. We want to come close to you. We want to know who you are. And we want to be transformed into your image as your sons, as your daughters. Lord, hear our cry and meet our every need and fulfill your will in our lives. Give us faith and give us trust in you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for paying the way for us to have everlasting life with you. Now let's just take a moment. We'll just be quiet. We'll just call out to him in our minds and our hearts and we'll listen to him talking to you. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen.